Agatha Christie's Miss Marple tells a story. I don't think I've ever told you, my dears, Hugh Raymond and Hugh Joan, about the rather curious little business that happened some years ago. I don't want to seem vain in any way. Of course I know that in comparison with you young people, I'm not clever at all. Raymond writes those very modern books all about rather unpleasant young men and women and John paints those very remarkable pictures of square people with curious bulks on them. Very clever. As Raymond always says, only quite kindly because he is the kindest of nephews. I am a hopelessly Victorian. I admire Mr. Alma Tadema and Mr. Frederick Langton, and I suppose to you they see hopelessly vex you. Now let me see what was I saying? Oh yes, that I didn't want to appear vain, but I couldn't help being just a tiny weeny bit pleasant with myself because just by a from the 
diseases without consulting her own doctor, whom she considered an old daughter, and the specialist has ordered some very expensive treatment and later found that all the child was suffering from was a rather unusual form of mislead. I just mentioned this, though I have a horror, a horror of digressing to show that I appreciate Mr. Betherick's point, but I still hadn't any idea what he was driving at. If Mr. Rhodes is ill, I said, and stopped because the poor man gave a most dreadful laugh. He said, 
least an hour, probably longer. The following were the points made. There was another door in Mrs. Rhodes' room leading into the corridor. This door was locked and bolted on the inside. The only window in the room was closed and latched. Estilé. 
Frankly, he said, I never believed. I thought Amy had been most of it up. Mr. Mrs. Rhodes, I gathered, was one of those romantic liars who go through life embroidering everything that happens to them, the amount of adventures that according to her own account happened to her in a year was simply incredible. If she slipped on a bit of banana peel, it was a case of mere escape from death. If a lamp said caught fire, she was rescued from a burning building at the hazard of her life. Her husband got into the habit of discounting her statements, her tale as to some women whose child she had injured in, in a motor accident and who had voted vengeance on her. Well, Mr. Rhodes had simply not taken any notice of it. The incident had happened before he married his wife and although she had read him letters coached in crazy language, he had suspected her of composing them herself. She had actually done such a thing once or twice before. She was a woman of hysterical tendencies who craved ceaselessly for excitement. Now, all that seemed to me very natural indeed, he have a young woman in the village. We have a young woman in the village who does much the same thing. The danger with such people is what is that when every anything at all extraordinary really does happen to them. Nobody believes they are speaking the truth. It seemed to me that that was what had happened in this case. The police I gathered merely believed that Mrs. Mr. Rhodes was making up this unconvincing tale in order to avert suspicion from himself. I asked if there had been any woman staying by themselves in the hotel. It seemed there were two, a Mrs. Grumbly, an Aglo Indian window, and a Mrs. Caruthers, rather, rather a horsey spinster who dropped her kiss. Mr. Petherick added that the most minute inquirers had failed to elicit anyone who had seen either of them near the scene of the crime, and there was nothing to connect either of them with it in any way. I asked him to describe their personal appearance. He said, he said that Mrs. Crumby had read his hair rather untightly done, was sallow-faced, and about 50 years of age. Her clothes were rather picturesque, being made mostly of native silk, etc. Miss Caruthers was about 40, wore pins nest, had close cropped hair like a man and wore money's coats and skirts. Dear me, I said, that makes it really very difficult. Mr. Petherick looked inquiringly at me, but I didn't want to say any more just then, so I asked what Sir Malcolm Aldi had said.
Full of your own. 
posted in a parcel first thing the next morning. When taxed with the truth, she broke. 